Connecticut and Massachusetts, Z&M Homes buys houses. Sell your property to the local guys. Needs repairs, updates, maybe foreclosure or inherited? No problem. We got you. Google or add us on Facebook at Z-A-N-D-M-Homes.com. Did you ever see the 1984 cult classic Repo Man starring Emilio Estevez as a young punk named Otto? who's been hired to repossess a Chevy Malibu, a Malibu where opening up the trunk is a really bad idea. If you haven't, you should, for a lot of reasons. One, the movie is hilarious. Two, the soundtrack is amazing. And three, you will spend the rest of your life, like me, wondering what the hell was in that trunk. Now, if you have seen the film, then you probably remember the character Kevin the Nerd, the grocery store stock boy who gets pushed around by Estevez while stacking cans of peaches. Trust me, it's a pivotal and unforgettable scene in a film listed as one of the top 25 greatest cult films of all time. Why am I bringing this up? Because the man who played Kevin the Nerd would not only star in other great films, he would also soon become the bass player for one of the most prominent West Coast hardcore bands in the world, the Circle Jerks. The name of that guy is Xander Schloss. Xander has not only been a member of the Circle Jerks for the last 38 years, he would also play with the Weirdos, Bob Forrest and Thelonious Monster, Mike Watt from the Minutemen, Stan Ridgway from the Wall of Voodoo, plus several collaborations with the late Joe Strummer from The Clash. But Xander Schloss isn't just another punk rock legend banging away at songs like Wonderful and Coup d'etat and Wasted and I Just Want Some Skank. Xander Schloss is a gifted musician who was formerly trained in jazz, particularly in guitar. On top of that, he spent the last 40 years arranging, composing, and heavily contributing to more than a dozen film scores and soundtracks, particularly with filmmaker Alex Cox. Like from the film Sid and Nancy from 1986, or 1987 Straight to Hell, Tapeheads from 1988, or The Winner from 1996. Last year, Xander Schloss released his very first solo album entitled Song of Songs, which was a collection of intensely personal and intimate songs that, while very different from what you might expect to hear from the bass player the Circle Jerks, is no less powerful in his own right. Next month, Xander releases his second solo album entitled California's Burning, which digs even deeper. He's also currently back on the road with the Circle Jerks, along with Keith Morris, Greg Hetson, and their new drummer Joey Castillo, because this year also happens to be the 40th anniversary of their third album, Golden Shower Hits. This is a man of very diverse talents, a guy who has both accomplished and endured a lot over the course of his lifetime. And he's about to talk about that and a whole lot of other stuff. And if you think the life of a repo man is intense, wait until you hear more about Xander Schloss from the Circle Jerks on Vaxi's Musical Podcast. How you doing? Oh, I'm good. Uh, yeah, sorry about yesterday. Dude. I, I went through a canyon, and then uh, <laughs> there were no cell phone towers around, and my girlfriend tried to fix the thing and <laughs> get me on her hot spot and do all this kind of stuff. You got nothing to apologize for. I've had like you know 17 different iPhones over the last 20 years. Not one of them can make a damn phone call, so I totally get it. You won't be the first one who's dropped the call with me, but I, I appreciate you having the flexibility to to try it again today. I will tell you, some of my questions are going to seem rather familiar to you. So if you don't mind. No, no worries. That's great. Well, uh, again, it's great to have you. As I told you yesterday, I was, I was listening to uh, to some of the singles off the new album, California's Burning, which is coming out next month. And I love I, I love the songs. I particularly like uh, Memories of Me and You. That's I think that's just a like a, a beautiful, beautiful song. Real personal, real intimate. It sounds fantastic. Tell me about the, uh, the new album and what people can expect from it. Well, first of all, Sorry to, to be that guy, but I'm going to correct you on the title. It's called Memory of Me and You. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, you know what? That's that's fine. That's just me typing too fast. No, it's it's perfectly fine, especially with my, my last album, Song About Songs. People call it the Song of Songs or Songs of <laughs> About Songs. It's Song About Songs. <laughs> but anyway... Memory of me and you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that is uh, 
that is a, a, a very personal song. It, it, it was coming on the tail of, of another song that's actually on, on the record. I was in a relationship at the time, and I had written a, a song when I was on a long tour called 100 Years, which was describing, of course, how time kind of had stretched being away from my love. And it was so sweepingly romantic that I think that, that she she, she short, sort of uh, – was was a little intimidated by the power of of my romance, and so <laughs> <laughs> I wrote another song. The next tour that I was on uh, for an extended amount of time called "Memory of Me and You," and it's basically about my my relationship with with romance. And at the time, I was reading Brian Wilson's biography. Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful uh, biography by Brian Wilson, who's who's one of my all time favorite artists, um, and and such a such a genius, but such a, a tragically wounded heart. And his vernacular is so childlike and and so beautiful. It's it, it, it's in his his vernacular this this biography. And so I started to think about you know uh, writing it in more of a kind of like a wounded childlike but yet very beautiful vernacular. Yeah. I'm totally with you on the, on the Brian Wilson thing. I, uh, for, for father's day, a couple of years ago, I took my, uh, my kids to see Brian do pet sounds in its entirety at Tanglewood in, in, in Western mass here. And, uh, I, I, I don't think I've ever cried like that at a concert before. And I, you know, I had the, <laughs> I was doing it in front of my kids. I felt like, well, either I look like the biggest pussy in front of my kids <laughs> Or this guy's really moving you to tears. I mean, really, it was um, amazing to see him perform all that stuff. Or maybe you're you're the biggest hero. You know what I mean? To be honest, it's like it takes a lot of guts to to shed a tear like that in front of your family. And <laughs> That's the one I'm going with. I'm going with the hero one. Yeah, and to have the sensitivity to show them that it's it's okay for a grown man to cry. Yeah, that's a lot of actually what what my stuff is about, you know, because like, you know, we were talking about it yesterday about how people act so tough. And to me, it, it's cowardly. What, what's really brave is, is to show that there are things to be sad about, to show that there are things to fear that you're scared. How can you develop courage if you're not scared? Right. And we talked about it yesterday when you said, you know, to, to go and expose yourself in an emotional and very vulnerable way may in fact be a very punk rock statement in itself because it is so, it does take so much courage to let that stuff out. Yeah, and that's why I call this punk, punk, punk rock music because, honestly, the most terrifying shows I've ever done are on my own, for one thing, to expose who I am and my vulnerability and to say the things out loud that I I basically stand scrutiny from the, the punk rock cops <laughs> and the judge and the jury, which is the audience, for being a pussy or, you know, being, I, I don't know. I think that that's the bravest thing that a person can do and try to connect and try to help people to transcend from this world in a way that is makes makes a person shed a tear like what you were saying what i think it also separates the musician from you know real artists when uh, when a guy like you know, like a bob dylan writes a lyric you know it's coming from a certain place it's not like it's just a contrived thing off the top of his head that he hopes that everyone likes there's something inside of him that's pushing that out to me that's that's a that's a very powerful very freeing liberating thing to do when you're creating art of of any kind Absolutely. And words are, are powerful. You know, words are so powerful. And to me, somebody like a Bob Dylan or a Neil Young seems to be diving into an underwater cave of gems. And each, each word that they say is, is coming from a place that creates a transcendent emotion. And, you know, these are some of my favorite people like Leonard Cohen or Neil Young or Bob Dylan. And, and so, of course, I'm going to try to emulate that on my own. And that's that's literally going back to the things that, that the artists that made me want to do this. The, the same could be said of I just want some skank or world up my ass. I mean, that had to come from a place of uh, of real emotion, too. 
Well, it does. But like I was saying yesterday, I, I think that on top of, of the core emotions like sadness and fear, I think there is anger, which is a more topical emotion. And I'm not, I'm not trying to take anything away from it. I think that, that what the circle jerks do is incredibly powerful. We're literally like conjuring this incredibly intense energy and sending it like a laser beam out into the audience and creating a human hurricane and they're sending it back. It's incredibly power. I'm not taking anything away from, from that by saying what I said. But you know, it's taken you a long time to get to this point too. I mean, you know, you that the, the last album just came out, was it was it last year or the year before? I mean, to to have taken you know this long career to get to that point where you're ready to expose yourself like that. I mean, that had to be just to, to make the decision that this is where I'm going to go. It's pretty brave of you to have done it. Could you have done it at an earlier time, or is this the, the, the right frame of mind for you that says, all right, now's the time to let this out? Well, the thing about it is, is like I was saying, uh, I've always been a melancholy and, and sad person, you know, since I was a, a kid, since I first started playing guitar, and those those were the things that I was really drawn to. And it takes what it takes for an artist to find his voice. To me, like, uh, it has a lot to do with, like, okay, if I don't do it now, I'm, I'm never going to do it. And also, like, honing, there's probably, I'm sure with, with many artists that, that you love, there's probably a, a thousand songs in a shoebox under their bed that they don't present. And so I've been, my goal is to find my voice as a writer and find my voice as an artist and present what I think is the most reduced and powerful, you know, representation of that. And so, yeah, I, I, I started writing songs on my own and kind of keeping it hidden probably for about 10 years. <laughs> and when I started to think like, okay, these songs, there's a thread of consistency with these songs. This is true. This is necessary. This is beautiful. This makes me feel something very deeply. Okay, I think that I could touch one or two people with this at best. And, you know, I mean, if you say something incredibly personal, you have the chance of, of uh, having that kind of impact with a lot of people. If you don't take the chance, I don't know, you might uh, buy a stucco monstrosity up, up in, like, some nice neighbor gated neighborhood and that's it. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> because there's no longevity in, 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 I don't know, writing, trying to write for the people you write for yourself and uh, hopefully things pan out. The timing of the new album coming out, uh, California's burning is, 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 is a little interesting because as it's coming out, you're going to be back on the road with the, uh, with the circle jerks. Are, are you planning at any point to start performing these songs live and maybe touring those songs rather than just i mean your commitment with the circle jerks is, is going to take you till i believe the end of i believe the end of this year but after the first of the year would would you consider playing these songs you live i'm actually working on something i don't know if you uh you heard like there's there's beautiful flute arrangements on uh memory of me and you and yeah. string arrangements on i'll be your friend of course like you, you, you mentioned yesterday, I, I have a background in jazz and, you know, I learned theory and composition and how, how to orchestrate for strings and woodwinds and stuff like that. So I, I took the opportunity to do that on this record. That being said, I actually went back in with a, with a professional camera crew and recorded the entire album all the way down with full ensemble with a string quartet and woodwinds and flute wow. on a, a, you know, full band. So that is in basically uh, trying to, to create a proof of concept of something that I can do as a residency in, uh, in, you know, three or four different markets because of the extensive nature of, of my, my uh, touring schedule with the circle Jerks. I'm unable to go out as a solo troubadour for, you know, 150 days. And so we're, we're trying to present this as an ensemble piece in a, a sit-down captive 
environment where people can really, really uh, absorb this. And that's that's initially until things cool out a little bit with the circle jerks. I have to really, really be strategic about the way I present this album. And with your jazz background, I assume you're doing all the arranging here as far as all the other ensemble pieces and, and instrumentation. Yes, I am. That's awesome. I was going to say, I can't think of a lot of you know, a lot of people in, in punk that would have the training to do that. I mean, I'm sure there are, but I mean, that, I mean, that's it's a pretty sophisticated undertaking to do that. Well, I mean, for me, like I, I think I was describing this to you yesterday. I I I got kind of got the call up to to do the circle jerks, and I was in, in a pretty bleak situation, living in a ten by ten office on Hollywood Boulevard, um, and had no money. I was literally like taking, you know, temp jobs, setting up stores. I even set up a circus when it came into town. <laughs> I know it sounds Dickensian, <laughs> but uh, the circle jerks, uh, you know, a car pulled up with, with a couple of people that I knew from, from Repo Man, and they said, the circle jerks are looking for a bassist. And I was like, why, why are you talking to me? I'm a guitarist. <laughs> and they're like, well, you look like you could use a gig. And I thought to myself, boy, I sure could. And uh, I was able to, uh, you know, I also uh, took bass lessons from a from a real prominent jazz bassist as well. I was able to go in there to, there to the audition and already know uh, the, all the songs off of the records before I joined the band <laughs> and got the audition. So the jazz training got me in, into punk, but I could have ended up in, in any any kind of situation sure. probably. I read uh, another interview that you had done where you know you see you learned all of their songs. They had only given you like a handful of songs to learn for the audition. By the time you got there, there wasn't a song that he had done that you didn't have kind of under your belt. Not a lot of people would do that if they're just looking to join a band last second. Well, yeah, because and that's my punk rock attitude. I've learned that I was punk because uh, I was like, learn three songs. Fuck you, I'll learn all three records. <laughs> and I always, you know, when people to ask me about how I rose to the occasion of some of these opportunities that I, I was given, like acting in Repo Man. I, I said yes. And then I, 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 I was overly prepared to do the job. Same with the Circle Jerks. I said yes. And I was overly prepared to do the job. Yeah. Because of my, my, my training and, um, I don't know, my ambition and my passion and all that kind of stuff, you know, like with, with, with Repo Man, of course, I was a class clown all my life and a performer and, you know, getting sent out into the hall and to the principal's office. So <laughs> I was prepared to be in front of a crew of 50 uh, with cameras pointed at me. And right. I want to ask you about uh, about that, because, you know, as I told you yesterday, you know, I, I bought the first out al- the first Circle Jerks albums you were on was wonderful in, in 85. And I bought it not even realizing Oh my God, that's Kevin the Nerd on the front on the front cover. You know, the, the guy holding the snake with, in a tuxedo is a whole lot different than a guy stacking peaches with Emilio Estevez. But how did you? How did that role even even come to you? How did how did you get involved in that movie? Well, as I was saying, uh, there's a song called "Bad Man" that's on the soundtrack, and at the time I was in a funk band in uh, the Inglewood, Compton, and Watts area called the Juicy Bananas. Uh, who appear on uh, the Repo Man soundtrack. Alex Cox, I, I also, uh, and, you know, I'll get back to the Juicy Bananas, but I, I also, uh, when I moved to Los Angeles and went to music school out here, most of my time, I, I was an aspiring film uh, film composer. So most of my time was spent at UCLA Film School scoring fil- student films. I, I put up a flyer that said, I will score your student film for free. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, if you give something a, 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 away for free, maybe you can open up a shop. Right. And it was a wise idea because I ran into a, a, a student there named Alex Cox, who was a graduate student. He was writing a script for his first theatrical release, and that film was Repo Man. <laughs> and so Alex had taken an interest in me musically before he took an interest in me as an actor. I'd never acted before. 
So I was in this band called the Juicy Bananas, and it's, it's another example of saying yes and being overly prepared for the opportunity. I was in a 7-Eleven playing video games, <laughs> and uh, there was a, a gentleman that was a cashier at the 7-Eleven. I saw a pair of drumsticks back there. I, I said, are you a musician? He said, yeah. I said, I am too. And he, he said, oh, yeah, what kind of music do you play? And I said, what kind of music do you play? Because I'm a smart guy. <laughs> and he said, I play funk. And I said, oh, I play funk too. And so he said, come down and play this gig with us tomorrow. Sit in with, with the band. And I said, okay. And so I drove down to Inglewood. I was late for the rehearsal. And we went to the gig. And I see these giant iron towers. And it turns out that it, it's, it's the Watts Festival. And oh. so my first, very first gig in Los Angeles was the Watts Tower Festival. And I, I said yes, <laughs> and I felt like I was overly prepared to do the job. <laughs> and after I got off the stage, there were a lot of people that were saying, you did a really great job. A lot of people that were screaming, get off the stage, honky. <laughs> So the middle ground was and probably that, acceptable, though. Yeah, and th that was that was basically my my sort of like first delving into Los Angeles music. So I played funk down in, in the areas that I described for the first couple of years, and was hanging out at UCLA's film school, scoring student films, and that's what got me in to uh, scoring feature films, and that's what got me into being open to any kind of music that came my way, which happened to be the Circle Jerks. Also involved in, in Repo Man was Mike Nesmith from the Monkees. As a musician and with his background, I mean, was he all in with having you, you know, be so involved in this? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I think Mike Nesmith is the reason why I eventually made it onto the screen because Alex and the producers had given me the job to play the role of Kevin the Nerd. And then suddenly, that same day, they said, oh, we're going to have to renege on that and we're going to have to take it back because we just uh, struck a deal with Sean Penn's younger brother, Chris Penn's agent, and Chris would be playing the role. And so my job at the time was as production assistant, and I literally delivered the dailies of his performance, which I was around the corner when Mike Nesmith said to Alex, and no, uh, no disrespect intended, rest in peace, Chris. He was very young. He uh, did a terrible job, and, and Mike looked at, at Alex and he said, oh, my God, this guy is horrible. What do we do? He said, well, and Alex said, well, originally I, I offered the role to Zonda. <laughs> and, uh, and Mike said, well, let's, let's, give him, let's give him a shot. So I had heard that. And they didn't tell me for like two weeks, so I continued to pick up cigarette butts on the <laughs> in the parking lot and do my my terrible production assistant job. And one day I arrived, and there was a star on a trailer with my name on it. <laughs> <laughs> you know the, the 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 thing about uh, about Repo Man, I think you know. I mean, I saw that that movie half a dozen times, you know, since it came out when I was in high school, and that soundtrack. I think was maybe one of the most important records that, you know, exposed people to punk rock than maybe anything else that was released in the eighties. I mean, it's not just the circle jerks, but it's, you know, Iggy pop and people getting exposed to black flag and, and fear. And a lot of people heard Pablo Picasso for the first time, you know, burning sensations did a version from the, uh, the modern lovers. I mean, that was a really important record that, that came out. It was almost every bit as, as much of a cult classic as the film itself. Well, I could tell you that, the, you know, because I experienced it, that that iconic soundtrack that you're speaking of was literally the reason they, they Universal put the movie out in limited show showings, and it, it was basically taken out of the theaters because of uh, you know poor sales, and based on the success of the soundtrack. They put the movie back in to the theaters. And also, of course, Siskel and Ebert liked it. But at any rate, that film soundtrack was not only uh, uh, iconic and 
maybe a first of its kind, but it was the first buzz bin, which is a, a modern word that they started using for these soundtracks that sell films. It was the first buzz bin soundtrack, a, a compilation of, of bands that actually sold the film. And it might have also been the invention of uh, the music supervisor because there were no music supervisors before that. But his use of music within that movie is is now, you know, the modern day music supervisor and soundtrack album. It was the first of its kind. I wore that damn thing out when I when I got it. It was just a it was such a you know, <laughs> great record. But your relationship professionally with, with Alex Cox extended long after that. I mean, you were involved in the Sid and Nancy scoring and, and the the soundtrack of that. You you also worked on the Walker with Alex Cox. I mean, you, you've done a lot of things with him over over the years. Well, yeah, I kind of hitched my wagon to Alex when when I um, and he hitched his wagon to a whole troop of actors and people that he would work with um, through uh, you know his career, which is what a lot of actor uh, what a lot of uh, directors do. But yeah, I hitched my wagon to Alex and. Uh, we became great friends, and I continued to work uh, on music and acting in Alex's films for a number of years. There's there's some obscure ones that you may not have heard of, like uh, Highway Patrolman, which is a film made down in Mexico. It's actually called El Patriero in Spanish. But uh, that was um, after Walker, after working with Joe Strummer on the soundtrack of Walker. Look, I mean, that... That opportunity that I described, where Michael said, let's let's give him a shot, that was the flashpoint of what I call the, the snowball of my career, because I was introduced to the whole cast of characters, joined the Circle Jerks, and then subsequently um, playing as a studio musician on Sid and Nancy, I met Joe Strummer, and then, you know, going on to Straight to Hell, you know, uh, that song that I sing within the movie is a co-write with Joe Strummer. Saucy Ketchup. Uh, <laughs> yes. And and that continued on uh, through Walker, where I had always brought my guitar to, to the set. So in Straight to Hell, I was playing guitar daily. I'd bring my guitar to the set, and I was playing guitar daily with Jane McGowan from the Pogues and right. Elvis Costello. And... Uh, you know, Joe was kind of lurking around the corner going, oh, this kid can really play, and he's really got a passion for it. So uh, I did the same thing down in Nicaragua when we filmed Walker, and Joe and I were living together in Granada. And I don't know, I was on tour with the Circle Church, and I got the call, hey, this is Joe Strummer, and I want you to come up to <laughs> Russian Hill and bring your Spanish guitar. I'm like... <laughs> Whoa, shit. Okay, I just got the call up. And, you know, I do the soundtrack with Joe, and then I wind up living in one of the best neighborhoods, Ladbrook Grove in, in London, and playing guitar with Joe Strummer. That just you know blows my mind. I mean, you know, you're talking about suddenly you're working with an absolute legend. By, you know, 1987, I mean, his, you know, his legend was pretty, you know, firmly set at that point. I mean, what, was, what was it like to, to work with him? Oh, my God. Well, you know, when you hear people talk about Joe, mainly, of course, we all know that the music was iconic and he was a brilliant writer, brilliant writer of lyrics and music. But most of what you hear uh, from people are people that encountered him as, as a person. He was truly a gentleman and had a wonderful sense of humor and a great guy to hang out with. I mean, it would be like... If, if you had the opportunity to meet Joe, he, he would he would make himself available to you uh, and you would have a great conversation and a great time with him. And so, you know, that's what many people remember Joe for as being a human being. So what was it like? I mean, it was was an incredible learning experience. And most of what I learned was how to be a gentleman. I mean, every, everything I've ever heard from, from Joe, you know, the, the, the legend, it, it's not too far off from what he actually was, even though he came from, like, a, a much more privileged background than, you know, maybe the, you would have expected from The Clash. I mean, the guy was the, it sounds like the guy was just the real deal all the time. Absolutely. 
So when you were when you were living with them, what was that setup like? Uh, it was like kind of an open air house in, in Granada, Nicaragua. We were down in in Nicaragua during the Civil War down there for uh, um, I think about three months. That movie was an epic movie, and it took a lot of time. It was a huge production, so you know you're spend, spending a lot of time with, with some of these other people. Me and Spider Stacy from the Pogues <laughs> and uh, Joe Strummer, and I, I, of course, you know Ed Harris and a whole cast of characters. But yeah, m- mainly it was uh, you know a, a really bonding experience of our friendship. So we became friends long before we became musical partners. A few years ago, and I mentioned this before, I, I had interviewed Keith Morris, and I had read his book My Damage that he had uh, written a, a few years ago. And you know, one of the things that that kind of stood out, and, and, and there's a couple of things I want to ask you about this is you know Keith described this this climate in which drugs and alcohol were just like an inescapable part of the landscape at that point, especially later on as the, uh, as the circle jerks were kind of winding down. Obviously not everybody gets out of it, but when you go back and, and play again with them, how different is it now to play that music in a different, more sober space? Because it, I mean, it, according to his book, it sounded like there were some times when things were very, very rough for not just him, but nearly everybody in that entire scene in Los Angeles. Oh, absolutely. It's as if, uh, I don't know, the government hit that, uh, my peer group, uh, the people of my generation that were doing all that. It was as if they hit us with like uh, Agent Orange or something because everybody was crazy and drug addled and just out of their mind, myself included. You know, my times with Joe, I was basically drinking a lot and smoking copious amounts of, of hash and marijuana, but being dropped back down in the scene, I sort of like got into to doing heroin. I, by the way, I'm 18 years sober, but uh, a lot of those people that didn't survive, they, they, they still continued to do what they were doing. And it's like, I, I sort of like got into to some self-preservation because I have a lot more work to do. And I, I may be crazy, but, you know, I do have my wits about me as far as what I need to do and the time that it will take to do it. But, yes, it was it was insane. And Keith got sober before any of us. And so I was touring as a as a, a heroin addicted bassist of the circle jerks and the weirdos. And uh, it was really, really tough, man. I wouldn't recommend trying to go around and 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 try try to find drugs in in every town because you find yourself in the most dangerous neighborhoods in the most dangerous situations and compromising the bands that you're playing with and everybody being mad at you because you're trying to hide your addiction but everybody knows that you're strung out so it it caused a lot of tension just watch the uh the the documentary about bob forrest bob and the monster and you know, I know you play with Felonious Monster, and I and I know that Bob has been a pretty important you know part of your life, not just musically, but you know he's gone on to be a, a very well known, very effective addiction specialist that has reached out to addicts in a way that is very powerful and very sincere. Tell me about uh, about your relationship with with Bob Forrest and 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 how it's it it evolved to the point where you know you found your sobriety too. Well, like I said, uh, when I joined the Circle Jerks, I was introduced to the whole cast of characters, with the Flea and Anthony's to the, you know, the, the guys in Fishbone, Norwood and Angelo, the Jane's Addiction people, the weirdos, Thelonious Monster, Bob and Thelonious Monster. Everybody was doing heroin, you know what I mean? Right. So I got into heroin and I was in, Thelonious Monster, we were all strung out and we beat the shit out of each other on stage and party like fucking crazy men. And the weirdos, of course, you know, Dix Denny and I played in Thelonious Monster and the weirdos. Dix just passed recently. Um, but uh, uh, Bob Forrest played an important part of my life as, as a, uh, uh, not only musically, but as a 
a running partner is what they call him. <laughs> so, so we were we were doing a lot of drugs together. But subsequently, I held out until I was 44 years old and getting myself cleaned up. And Bob had already become a, an addiction specialist. He'd already gotten sober and got involved with Music Cares. So Bob is, is really the person that I called when I uh, wanted to get sober. And uh, he got me into my first rehab, and that didn't take. And so when I, I needed to get back into rehab, I called Bob again, and he got me in my second rehab. And that was the one that clicked for me. So and I, I've actually done a lot of sober work. Uh, in, I, I worked in treatment for about five years, and one of those one of those treatment centers was a treatment center that Bob was involved with. And uh, it's kind of strange to go from a person who you know is absolutely fucking insane and will steal <laughs> your CDs to, to buy more drugs to somebody who will help you help to save your life. He's he's got a, a real interesting story too, and we've had an interesting s- story together. It's it's funny that we started talking about guys who you know, musicians that were you know vulnerable and were able to sing about their their deepest emotions. Bob was one of those guys, probably still is for that matter. It's interesting how a guy who had been that vulnerable in his musical career has been able to kind of channel that in a different direction where he's helping people at their most vulnerable times. It's really pretty remarkable what he's been able to do with his life, but more importantly, what he's been able to do to help other people who have struggled with the same disease as he's had. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's a triumphant story. And you talk about Bob and the monster, you know, some of the guys in the band were, were pissed about the, the arc of that movie and it, it kind of going more into the fact that, that Bob had become the person that he is today and focusing on that. Well, I mean, it's a good story. It's yeah. like, what are, you can't just talk about like, you know, this and that, you know, and like, you got to talk about what, what, what's the triumph of the story. And that's, that's Bob's triumph. And I'm trying to create that kind of triumph for myself and being brave enough to, to start a solo career at the age that I'm in and expose my most sort of vulnerable feelings in my music. It definitely shows. I mean, there's no way to listen to that music and not feel, not feel emotionally connected to what you're, you're getting at. Even if it's not necessarily something that connects to you right away, there's no way you can deny the passion of what you're doing. So, I mean, I, 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 I applaud you that the, uh, that the arc of your career has kind of come, you know, to that point where now, you're that guy that can actually be that vulnerable and be that open. That's like we said before, I mean, that takes great bravery, but also a good deal of talent to pull it off too. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't suggest you try it at home. It's like one of those uh, <laughs> documentaries where they say these people are experts and the professionals don't try this at home. Yeah, the, the, the Xander <laughs> Schloss home game probably isn't a good one to take home with you. Yeah, you, you, you have to have some sort of disclaimer on it. Like, you know, don't try to wrestle with the, the wild alligator um, <laughs> unless you have professional experience. You, you mentioned, uh, you know, playing with the Weirdos. That's a, that's a band that has been around for forever. I mean, they really were kind of like the star, they're like the ground zero of, of punk in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's cool that you play with them. But, 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 but one project that you did, which I, I wanted to ask you about, which I think is, was so cool, because I remember hearing it for the very first time and thinking, I love this record, was uh, Ball Hog and, and, or Tugboat with Mike Watt. You were on that record along with nearly everybody else who's ever recorded music. I mean, Eddie Vedder and Dave Grohl and Frank Black and you know, Henry Rollins and uh, Mark Lanigan. Just a wildly underappreciated record from a wildly underappreciated musician like Mike Watt, who I absolutely adore him in, in the Minutemen and everything else the guy's been in. Well, I mean, Mike is a genius, you know, and he's one of those musicians that is a musician's musician. And that was the type of musician that, that I aspired to be. And I, I saw the merit in punk rock when I saw people like Mike Watt, you know. Uh, I thought the Minutemen were ac- absolutely genius. And I don't know, I got the call up. I guess I was one of those guys that was on his radar. He gave me some real high compliments in the studio uh, when we were recording um, Ball uh, Piss Bottle Man, 
he said that you know he he doesn't like a whole lot of guitar riffs so that he dug me and he said that my playing reminded him of of D Boone. Wow. Um which I mean come on dude that's <laughs> that's like that's, such a high compliment. I will never forget that. That's crazy. I mean I always thought that the the, the Minutemen were were less of a punk band and really just like a jazz trio. I mean when you listen to some of the things that they did on those on those records and and you know, certainly like you know, double nickels on the dime. That's a jazz record, as far as I'm concerned. Yes, and they're they're kind of an art band, and, and I I saw similar, I don't know, indicators in in the weirdos music. They were they were more of a like a pop art band than uh, a punk rock or a hardcore band. You know, there was sophisticated songwriting and pop pop melodies, and that was one of the, one of the reasons why. I saw merit in in the weirdos. Not only that, I was I was just dear dear friends with the brothers John and Dick Denny, and you know, just great people, great artists. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Mike Mike had had created a band that was punk was different then. Everybody was welcome. All sorts of different types of music. Like you you go from like the Flesh Eaters, which you know, with G- DJ Bonebreak, here's another musician who's orchestrally trained and playing the vibes and Chris Desjardins and, yeah. you know, John Doe and, you know, people like the, the the Plugs. You know, there were some very fine musicians, the Blasters, the Plugs, yeah, the Minutemen. It was all inclusive. There were women that were, were making incredible music. There were uh, a lot of people ethnic people that were making incredible punk music a lot of, a lot of, of a lot of roots music i mean you mentioned you, you mentioned x i mean john doe's done a lot of that stuff but you know but you know like the gun club a perfectly good example i mean you, you know the 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 punk police probably wouldn't have uh, probably wouldn't have allowed that to happen <laughs> at some point but i mean all great stuff that should have been easily accepted well i gotta say i think that the punk police were uh created by the fans you know, and those were the people, some of the nicest people that I've met in the world were these, these people that, that, that I've, I'm talking about. They were, were not only incredible artists, they were wonderful human beings and very, very nice and very, very welcoming. Um, the punk police, I think, comes from the fans who are like, you have to dress this way and you have to sing this way and you have to act this way. It's like, that's what you saw. But you didn't see behind the scenes where everybody was hanging out and fucking being dear friends and a community of people. Yeah. Um, it, there was no division between the promoters and the bands and bands would help other bands put together bills and stuff like that. There was none of this competitive stuff. And I'm starting to sound like an old man. <laughs> there was none of this competitive Joey bullshit that's happening today with, you know, presenting. Everybody is presenting. Everybody is virtue signaling and presenting. And it's ruining the whole fucking landscape of not only music, but the whole human fucking race. It's true. So my rant's yeah. over. No, I, no it's, a, it's a good rant. It's a, it's, it's, it's a solid one. We've, we've all built up these, these rules that we expect that everyone's going to have to see things our way or the highway. It's a, there's no... There's no consensus anymore. It's like I'm right, you're wrong, you're left, you're right. It's it's like to me, it's just total bullshit. Well, it's like censorship, and it's like you can't do this, and you can only do this. And it's like you want us all to be sheep. I thought great art was being an individual and doing something that was outside of the rules, and that's what I continue to do with with my record. Going back to my record, you know, and my what I'm doing as as an artist now. It's against the rules for a punk, hardcore punk rocker to do what I do. And I, and I invite people to call me a fucking pussy (laughs) because I'm doing what I'm doing. And I don't know what's more punk rock than that. It's like, go ahead, take a jab at me. I know who I am. I know what I'm capable of. I'm trying to do something beautiful and trying to, connect with the world that I live in. We only have one life as far as we know. Um, and so I'm trying to make my life the way, the way I want to make it and be the person that I want to be now in the moment, 
not somebody that you put in a box in 1984 or whatever. You say, this is your box. You stay in that fucking box. And if you come out of it, we don't want to know what you're doing. Yeah. Well, you're you're the artist. You should be the one to dictate where you want to go. I mean, listen, there's some guys in their 60s that can that can do it and want to do it the same way they've always done it, but then there's also the artist that just wants to grow and wants to you know, you know, spread out what they can do creatively. Yeah, and then I get my revenge, and then I, I become the fucking boss, and then I put everybody else in boxes because now I have the power. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way power works. That's the best position ever. So the the uh, the circle jerks are going to be going out in a, in a couple of weeks, a couple of shows with TSOL and, and negative approach, and then November, you guys are supposed to be playing with the Descendants, which I think is you know fantastic considering that you know Milo Ackerman just had a heart attack. I mean that guy's got you know a PhD and a set of balls to come back and play live after what he's been through. That's I mean it's it's just awesome. He's 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 definitely a hero of, of punk rock. And talk about another musical band; those guys are incredibly musical. But it makes sense, you know, like Bill Stevenson and, and Keith have been friends since elementary school. And, you know, what, what, what trips me out, dude, is that if you would have told me when I was in my 20s that one day you're going to be, you're going to be 60 years old and you're going to be in a seminal hardcore band and you're going to be more popular than ever and selling out big venues and people are going to be going crazy over it and you're going to be incredibly successful doing it. I would have said, what kind of fucking weird dream are you having? (laughs) You know, for one thing, I'm a fucking like, I'm, I'm an outsider. Every time I come to a door, it, it slams in my face because nobody wants me around basically saying punk rock. We were outsiders. You know, yeah. nobody wanted us around. Everybody wanted to shut us down. And I thought, oh, this is just a trend. I had no idea that it was probably one of two of the greatest cultural revolutions to ever occur in the world. So I thought it was a trend. I would have, I would have said, you're crazy. There's no way. There's no way that's going to happen. But here we are. Here we are. There you go. Uh, the name of the new record is California's Burning. It's coming out next month, and the Circle Jerks are going on the road this month too. Xander, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. I'm so glad we were able to uh, to, re- to reschedule this and 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 do it to uh, do it correctly. Yeah, and I I just want to add that uh, I'm releasing singles, so there you know there's a I'll be your friend is a preview on uh, streaming, um, Memory of Me and You, and. Another single called Play Me a Happy Song is dropping on streaming services. So we're revealing some of the songs from the record. The record is due out October 13th on Blind Owl Records and all streaming services. Remember, it takes a village to raise a solo artist. You know, just because I'm in a big ass fucking band that everybody knows about doesn't mean that people are clamoring and banging down my door to listen to my solo music. So if you're listening, please, please listen to what I'm doing now as an individual as well and tell a friend. It's it's great stuff, Xander. I really I I really do like it a lot. So to have you here today, it's great and, and I and I do appreciate it. So Thank you. Thank you so much for thinking of me. It's it's it's, it's an honor. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, Xander. <laughs> no, seriously. You you have no idea. It's like I I'm, I still have that kind of humility and that's the kind of thing I learned from from Joe. It's like it is an honor when somebody thinks of you and reaches out to you to do something like this. It is an honor. I've, I don't take it lightly. I've I've had great luck on this on this podcast, booking people, scheduling people, and then and then having the, you know these conversations. So people I would never have dreamed when I was uh, you know nineteen twenty years old that I get a chance to talk to. And uh, and and you're one of those people, so it it the pleasure really is all mine, and I and I appreciate what you're oh. trying to trying to say, but it it really it means a lot to actually get a chance to talk to a guy whose music I've been listening to since 1984. So it's great. Oh well, thank you, thank you so much. It's, <laughs> right. uh, I really enjoyed our conversation. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Xander. Take care. Yes, of course. Bye bye. 
The name of the new album by Xander Schloss is called California's Burning. And, of course, the Circle Jerks are, like I said, on the road as we speak. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, feel free to like it, share it, tell all your friends about it. You can find out all the latest updates about the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. You can also email me at backsatrock102.com. I'd love to hear what you think. And thanks again to Z&M Home Buyers for their support. But most of all, thank you for listening to Baxi's Musical Podcast.